Welcome to The Complete Musician, creativity at its core, exploring innovative musical ideas, thoughts, and techniques for the modern musician in today's society, with your hosts, James Nagus and Drew Phillips. Hey everybody, and welcome to The Complete Musician Podcast, episode number nine. I'm Drew, and I am not your host today. And I'm James, and I am your host. And just like our new format here, whoever's not hosting doesn't know what we're talking about until exactly right now. And that is web presence. So we've kind of touched on this in a few episodes before, but a lot of these things kind of come full circle because it's all part of being a complete musician. And specifically, I want to talk about how to use web presence for your advantage to further your your career, to act as a portfolio, but then also just talk about the things not to do. So there's kind of three areas that we're gonna talk about. Number one is website. Number two is social media. And number three is just other venues, something like YouTube, which kind of goes with our recording topic from a few episodes ago. So let's just start with websites. Um, First of all, why? would one make a website? What do you think? Uh, Your website is kind of your online personality and it shows off the the things that you do and the things that you want others to know about you. Right. And, you know, it just like if you're searching for a restaurant for a menu, first thing you do is you, you type in the restaurant and if there is no website, you're like, well, what? That's always really weird to me. Yeah, that's really weird when I'm like searching for something and there's no website for something. I always get a little weird vibe from that. And, you know, you as a person and as a musical entity, um, it's the same kind of thing. The first thing that someone's going to do when they hear your name is probably look you up. And the best way to control what they find when they do that is to put it out yourself. So it's to make your own website. And there's a couple different venues i know we've taken different approaches um you yours through wix right wix.com i think mine is through wix yeah and what is that like what was that process like for you actually it was pretty easy i got the idea from another friend's website uh who said that it was a, a an easy template to use for someone who's not so technologically advanced as myself and i wanted something that was pretty DIY that I didn't really have to stress over and had a good template to go from. So it was a a pretty good option for me. Again, it had all the pages and all the formats and lots of different options laid out for me. Um, Like I said, not very technologically advanced. So it was a great option for me. And what is the address of that website? That is drewphillipshorn.com. I did have to pay for my website name, but it's really cheap. I, I yeah. think it's like, I, I it's like fifteen bucks a year or something. Really, ten to fifteen bucks is really cheap. Yeah, I think you can get domains. Yeah, between five and fifteen, especially if you have a unique name that it wouldn't be taken. Um, if your name is John Smith, I doubt you'll be able to get johnsmith.com, but maybe <laughs> johnsmithcontrabassoon.com. That could work. John Smith bagpipes plays well. dot com. <laughs> That would never happen. Poor John. <laughs> Poor um, John. So but you, yeah, you took the Wix approach. There are other sites, I think Squarespace, and there's other um, programs. Like Weebly like, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dreamweaver that are more graphically based, I think, that are easier for people who don't want to code. I decided to do the hard way, and I found um, a template for a website, and then I just dug into the HTML code and kind of just taught myself just because I was – I thought it was fun. Um, good, because I can't do that at all. And <laughs> it's good we have people like you. Well, you know, different strokes. Um, but the end result of both of ours, I know, is essentially it's an online portfolio. You know, I think we both made it uh, partially to show off our music, partially for job applications. Um, I know my first online website I ever made was actually when I was student teaching. And it was well, prior to student teaching, too. It was a little portfolio where i had conducting videos and my um, my resume and things like that yeah i had to do something similar during my music technology classes in undergrad i had to make a website that was pretty basic with like you said your uh your qualifications a little biography and 
maybe some kind of media of playing or something you were involved in. Yeah. And even if your website is just one page with maybe your picture, a short bio, and how to contact you, that's better than having nothing. And it's also better to have maybe less than to pad it with all these other things that are extraneous and not necessary. Right. And you can always add to it later down the road should you want to add sections. I'm looking at my website right now, and the headlines I have are my biography. I have lessons uh, the, that I teach lessons and what my philosophy is on that. I have a tab for all my compositions, um, and I have media of myself playing and things I've been involved with in my own performance, uh, a contact screen, and then upcoming events that I'm involved with in case people want to come see me play and other things that I'm doing as a soloist. And the great thing of when you make it yourself is you can cater your website to exactly what you need and update it yourself without relying on a third party. Right. So I think website's very important. Go do it. Get your hands dirty. Uh, experiment with it before you need to have one. I think that's a good idea. Agreed. And look at other people's for inspiration about what you like and what you don't like and what you want to have on yours to showcase yourself professionally. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is social media. And this one, mm. we could we could spend time talking about the good uses, but I think it's maybe more important to highlight the improper uses. uses that we've found because uh i don't know i mean we've talked about this before and we actually both lecture on this too as part of our just how to be a good person lectures yeah <laughs> um what are some poor examples well i guess before that social media we're talking what facebook facebook um which is the big one right now twitter instagram mm -hmm. oh yeah right and the Big general thing here is that once you put something up online, it's always going to be there. And Even if you delete it, it's kind of still there. Yeah, so. and you're always going to be kind of judged for what you put online, especially if you're only friends with people you know really vaguely. Uh, like, I know we are friends with people uh, on Facebook that maybe we've met a couple times, uh, but aren't, aren't like best friends with. It's not like the people we text every day to talk to, but we want to make sure we showcase our professional side to them and uh, leave like a good impression as opposed to annoying them with constant irritating posts. Right. And these little snippets uh, may just be little snippets to you, but for someone else, it's kind of your complete identity because that's all they know. Absolutely. And one of the first times that this really comes up is someone who's preparing for student teaching or an early job application. And one of the first things they say actually is before you go into student teaching, shut your Facebook down. Or at I the very least, do don't friend accept your students. Absolutely. Now, that um, teacher student relationship is different depending on really level of teaching. I think at the collegiate level, there's there's still certainly boundaries one should not cross, but there's a congeniality that is different than public school teaching. Because I'm friends, and I know we're friends with our students. Um, I'm friends with quite a few of them on Facebook, but it's so that I can use my Facebook as a more more of a professional outlet so that when they do something really great, like I have my high brass studio here at Liberty. And when I go to concerts, like last night, they had an orchestra concert and they played really well and uh, they wanted to be showcased so that um, people could see all the, the great things that they'd done that they'd had this experience. So I can take a picture and then put it online to promote my the studio that we're doing great things and we're, we're having these experiences of playing like it was an all Beethoven concert and that they got to play this really cool literature and I could tag them in it so that their friends and family could see what they're doing. Right. And I think that brings up one potential solution. If the problem is don't let your personal profile engage in your professional activities, then create either another profile just ded dedicated to that ensemble or a page. I think we both have pages for our horn studios, like you were saying, and that's a great outlet where if someone goes to that, they're not going to see pictures of your, you know, high school beach trip back in 1823. 
Um, <laughs> but it's just going to be a page that's more professionally based um, and just better all the way around. I think that you're right. Thinking about your social media and more of a professional aspect is best. Um, even if, if you even if you don't make a personal page or excuse me a page for your business or your organization uh, you can still keep your own profile pretty clean and don't not... have pictures with red solo cups and to, exactly Ever. leaving the best impression possible so like we were saying don't go on these endless facebook rants about things um or at least try not to um and, and vague booking about things or bragging about yourself there's nothing wrong with sharing information but not to every single day say look what i accomplished today it just kind of gets old and kind of seems a little bit arrogant i wouldn't do it i mean i think i just post pictures of either music related things or food or um that's about it the only pictures i really post are i you know pictures with uh pictures of my wife pictures of our family and then when something musical happens that um with with my kids or or some kind of musical experience that i i'm glad i shared um with someone then that's pretty much all i post and tacos and lots of tacos and mountain dew and mountain dew and maybe halo so the summary here is be smart what you post think about what someone looking at your profile would think if you just based on what they see and um think before you post it's like looking before you leap it's a good rule of thumb and i'm sure you can think of a whole bunch of other poor uses that you've personally seen people do why you would block certain people um what you've seen that you go like eh, i don't know if that's really the right way to do things and the same things apply for instagram and twitter it's just in different capacities. Just, you know, play it safe, essentially. There's, yeah, there's nothing wrong with being promotional about yourself on your social media. I think that's a, a good skill to have is promoting things that you do, but not to annoy everyone with um, not popular opinion kind of thoughts or uh, just kind of treating it as your own personal blog entry every single day. That's not the most fun thing to read. Right. So... Absolutely. I mean, social media is a huge beneficial tool for promotion, like you said. Um, but I think, you know, just highlighting the what not to do is kind of good to think about once in a while. Uh, and that leads into the... Actually, that leads kind of into our sponsor. Do you, do you know who this week's sponsor is? I don't know. Let's find out. Here we go. Hi, I need a ride to the library at the corner of 5th and Fountain Street. Does this sound like you? Are you tired of dealing with crabby cabbies? Get out of the way, Joyke! I'm gonna run over your neighbor and your dog! Are you too mainstream to use Uber? Nah. Well, lucky for you, there's a new ride in town. Ride! of the Valkyries. The newest taxi service in town. Download our app or give us a ring. Cycle. Our cars are gassy and all our drivers are named Richard Wagner. Call us toll expensive at 1-800-555-Gotterdammerung. This app and service has never existed and will never exist because that is absurd and no one has the patience and time to listen to the whole ring cycle anyway and is not affiliated with anyone anything ever is not an official sponsor of the Complete Decision Podcast. And we're back. And that brings us to our last of three little segments here talking about web presence and that is a YouTube channel or more specifically recordings kind of recapping what we talked about last time which was or at least last time we talked about recordings which was essentially do it and create an online portfolio of your playing, assuming it's good and flawless, or at least, you know, a good representative uh, performance from you. And I was thinking about this recently because it's all state etude time, and a lot of students are preparing their etudes, and I was thinking, well, if they don't have a private teacher, or even if they do, where's the first place they might go to find an example of what to do? 
and that's YouTube, right? Absolutely, yeah. Or just in general, people trying to look for recordings of things. I, that's oftentimes the first place I'll go. I mean, besides you know iTunes libraries and Spotify, and Me too. If you don't have accounts or you don't have access. YouTube is probably the easiest thing to do. Yep. So just like website, um, you can control what's out there by putting it out yourself. And you only really want to put the best things that make the best impression on the people that are searching for whatever they're looking for because you don't want people's first impression of you, again, if they're searching for you as if they're wanting to kind of take from you if you're a teacher or, um, you know, you're, you're trying to be a professional player. Uh, again, when people hear your name, they'll either Google you or they'll go on YouTube and see if they can hear you play. And if the thing you're putting up is not the best quality, what's that going to say to those people looking for you? And there's a lot of bad recordings on YouTube. It, a guilty pleasure of mine sometimes is just going and trying to find the worst ones. So many hours have been wasted on YouTube and just like a YouTube black hole of going <laughs> from bad video to bad video of people that think it's really good. There's a difference between parody and really like someone trying their best. And you don't want to put something up if you're a budding professional musician of you doing your best and it's really not something that you'd be really proud of. Right. And not everyone will have your sense of humor, so they might not get it. Especially, um, I don't know, if a woodwind player or a violist is listening to your recording, they might not have a sense of humor. Um, at least the violist probably doesn't. So Definitely not a bassoonist. Definitely not. And, you know, John Smith, the contrabassoonist, is just... He's just out. He's wandering the forest. He's just lost completely. So well, he won't get there. Well, he's looking for his bagpipes. That's why. Oh, he was just, well. Not thought he was looking for more sticks to make another instrument. And a bag, a paper bag, and sticks. And that's a bagpipe, right? Exactly. Um, so getting back to web presence, we you know we talked about websites. We talked about social media. We talked about recordings. Any other thoughts on what you've done personally? to either enhance your web presence or things that you tell your students to avoid? I think we covered most of it. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think with website and with your social media and your YouTube channel or any kind of media that you post of yourself, if you're not going to be the most proud of it, you wouldn't want your future employers to see that, then I would absolutely not post it. And you should definitely tailor, again, like you said, your website and your social media should showcase the best part of you and not not your personal, your personal life because that's your personal life for a reason and not your public life, which is not your career. Right. And one thing, too, I'll add is if you've actually had success using LinkedIn, send us a message at coremotorhorn at gmail.com because... I'd Please. be really curious to see what you actually did. Cause I, what is LinkedIn? <laughs> I, I still haven't found a use for it. I'm sorry. I have uh, accolades there and accreditation and friends, and I don't know what it does. I get a lot of requests from random people that in like South America and Europe that I've never met before who are, I, who are musicians, I guess. And I'm like, how did you find me? Who? I don't know. So... There it is. Be smart. So speaking of online presence, um, now on to something completely unrelated. Uh, James and I are, uh, we both in, in the past few years have gotten our, um, our doctoral degrees. Now, that means that we help musicians, but we're not, we don't really help, uh, you know, people. Like if you were bleeding on the side of the road, we could you know, apply pressure, but we really couldn't save your life. So, um, we're not that kind of doctor. We're not that kind of doctor. So, uh, but we can help people musically. And so we've decided to have this new section, um, where, where we give good, uh, well, um, advice. We'll just say advice, no qualifier, uh, advice to people, um, based on, uh, popular opinion questions that I found on the internet on this really, um, this great website you may have heard of called Reddit. Anyway, um, I just found some music questions that I thought we'd answer in our new section called... House Calls with Dr. Phillips and Dr. Nagus. 
Okay, so uh, there are three questions here, and um, I, we need uh, unsolicited, really, uh, advice for, for these people who really want to know the answers to these budding, budding musical questions. Okay, so James, um, the first question that I have for you, ahem, so this person on Reddit asks, I have been known to conduct symphonies as I listen to them, but when I see one performed live or in a video, the conductors always seem fast or off-tempo. Why? I, I have a, a thought a process for this, but I want to hear what you would say. Well, it, it seems to me that this person is stuck in an episode of The Next Generation where oh. their temporal bubble is different from the temporal bubble of the orchestral stage. Now, mm. as we know from quantum theory, that the difference in space and time, you'll have different effects. So um, my advice to them would be to, well, get their medical tricoder out, scan their body first, make sure that they are not demolecularizing, uh, and then perhaps go get their buddy data, go to the conductor's podium and see if their sense of time and perception has shifted. Uh, that's a that's really great advice. Um, and you may be right, but you may also be wrong. You see, I can always answer this in an, in another scientific way. You see, the reason that conductors conduct is seeming to be fast or is seeming to be off tempo from the orchestra. Here's the reason: uh, it, we all know that uh, sound travels faster than sight. We all know that. So. Uh, the reason is the conductor is the most in, inconsequential part of the orchestra. Really, they they don't lead. They don't really do anything. We we don't pay attention to them, and you never should. What's a conductor? What, uh, right. Um, the, it's something on a train. Anyway, so what what really happens? Like I said, um, sight is much much slower than sound is. So the real person leading the orchestra and leading that ensemble is the 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 person who's sitting in last chair second violin because they are the latest person to play. As we know from how little they move their bow as compared to the concertmaster. So really, the the later you play the better it will be. And so you should always, always be behind the conductor and, and because the sound will, will be much slower, or excuse me, much faster than the when you look at them. Um, so again, kind of dealing with that temporal space and time bubble continuum um, galaxy thing that you were talking about. So you, you need to make sure that the, the second violin is the one leading the orchestra to play just as behind as possible. It, it really, I think that's what our, our great con, our composers really meant. That makes a whole lot of sense. And yeah. I've actually seen last chair, second violins, both either be stagnant, like they don't know what's going on. Or moving around trying to conduct the rest of the group. And I guess that makes sense. That's why. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. So, I mean, science can explain all of this. So um, I hope that enlightened that person. Um, and that was submitted 18 days ago. So um, by George E. Hale. Okay. So, George, I really hope that helped you out there. Um, our next question um, are there any tips for someone who wants to pick up the violin as a secondary instrument? Oh, <clears throat> I have some really good ones. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing you're going to do is grab your case and set it flat on the floor. There's these little latches, usually three per case. You want to flip those up. If you flip them down, the case is probably upside down. You're going to have a bad time. That's Go a good ahead note. and good open note. the top of that case. And then with your hands, with fingers, go ahead and pick up, lift the instrument up not down up, up um from the case and uh that's basically it you've picked up the violin oh that's a good thought um and so i'm gonna go a little bit further with this and i'm gonna talk about maybe playing a little so first uh my first advice for playing is don't but then if you feel the need to disobey then you to our second uh piece of advice so you need lots of dexterity with both of your hands and so with uh you need to play a lot of video games first uh lots of lots of skyrim lots of of halo 
Um, maybe maybe some uh, Super Smash Brothers. Maybe something that involves lots of finger dexterity because that's that's really necessary. Um, then the other thing that you need to do is make sure that you develop that skill of the bow moving across the strings. And so what you do is you, you pick up the violin and you wedge it as hard as you can in between your neck and your shoulder. Um, if you if you bend your your head over and look really pained and try to really impale your neck, then you've got in the right position. So then with your right hand, it's a really like a Mr. Miyagi thing where the wax on, wax off um, kind of motion. So you need to go wash your car for many, many hours and maybe your friend's cars as well because that gives you the, the perfect motion of pulling the bow back and forth across. Then with your left hand, um, you go and you, you touch the strings. You can go over the, the bridge like uh, with your left hand or under. It doesn't really matter um, because, uh, you know, we see violinists doing anything. It doesn't matter to be good. So then you, I don't know you, what they're doing. Well, right. And so you wiggle your fingers around and do that wax on, wax off thing um, really quickly. And every once in a while, you need to make sure to pull the violin off of your impaled neck and stare at it like it's done something bad to you. And you can just squint and glare because that makes the sound better. And so then you go back and, and saw away for a while. And um, that's that's really as good as you're going to get. I think you can't go wrong with that advice. You'll yeah. be playing like a last chair second violinist in no time. And lead that orchestra. Exactly right. Um, that comes from The, the Flash. Ooh, um, that's, uh, I didn't know he was picking up a violin. So anyway, uh, the last uh, question I have for today. <clears throat> uh, how hard would it be to learn the banjo with no prior music experience? I'll let you go first on this one. Okay. Um, uh, really, the answer is uh, it, it's not hard at all. All you need is a match and some gasoline. That's true. I would say all you need is a washing machine that's off kilter, so it produces a beat, and then you just grab that banjo and then just kind of pluck the strings along, and if you can maybe lose a couple of teeth in the process um, and, you know, have some tattered clothes, maybe Mm. have a log you can sit on. Make sure your mother goes to jail and that your pickup truck has broken down prior to beginning. And make sure you're outside when you play, too. Exactly. Um, and this is all before, of course, lighting it on fire. All right. So so that's my advice to Brett Austin. I really hope that helped you out. That was only posted um, uh, 29 days ago. So hopefully he's lost his teeth and sent his parents to jail so that he can sing about how to get them out um, after or before he's lit himself on fire. Anyway, so that ends our advice section. Um, I, if you have any more burning musical questions, please send, and we will uh, we will make sure to answer and and influence your musical education. Because we are doctors, and we've had years of education preparing us exactly for this type of situation. And you'd never not listen to a doctor, would you? And with that, that's going to bring us to the end of the episode. I want to thank you again for listening, as always. And if you have any comments, complaints, or unique ideas for a fantasy novel go ahead and send those to coremotohorn at gmail.com or write in the comments below thanks for listening and remember what albert einstein said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and still playing the bassoon